Well, thank you. <laughs> That's my dad. <laughs> uh, would you guys all just take a, a moment with me, just a, just a, a quick moment of silence to uh, think about those wonderful days where the remote didn't work because I forgot to turn it on, but also when mom would tuck you in at night, get you comfy, open up her laptop and read you the latest white paper or case study she'd been emailed. <laughs> Mom didn't do that. <laughs> she told you stories, bedtime stories. Why? Because, because stories are powerful and they create connections unlike anything else possibly can. And I want to get into that and I want to talk to you a little bit about it. But first, I'm just realizing there is absolutely no attractive way for me to get the rest of the way up the stage from this position. <laughs> so I am going to go this way while I help clear something up. And Damien mentioned an elephant in the room, but there's, there's another one I think that's kind of out there. And that Damien maybe helped clear it up. But that, that is, uh, who the heck is this guy? And... Uh, How'd he end up on stage? And the truth is, I'm Chad. Jessica isn't completely sure. <laughs> and neither was I. Until I sat for a little bit and thought about it, and I realized that the way I ended up here on stage was because my dad juggled apples. I'm not going to explain that to you right now. But it is the reason that I ended up here. All of us have stories. I want to share one with you right now. When I was a teenager, I rode a six-foot unicycle. And I don't mean that I just did it like at the fair or performed. I rode it to get places. Now, one of the problems was, though, that I never mastered the ability to actually get on the six-foot unicycle without a ladder. So if I fell... I'm walking and pushing the rest of wherever I'm going. And the other thing I never mastered was a little skill that they call rocking. And what rocking does, it allows you to kind of stay in one place. Because the way a unicycle's made is either the wheel's moving or the part you're sitting on is moving. So I decided one day, you know what? I think I can ride this all the way from my house to my high school. Because nothing says, hey, ladies. <laughs> like a guy on a six-foot unicycle. And you're probably like, why is there a bear? Well, that's because I was also the mascot of my high school, which happened to be a bear. And when I was really feeling desperate, I would break out the six-foot unicycle and ride it in the bear suit. I only did that at the football games. So I decided I could make this trip. And so I took off. Now, remember, if I fall off, I'm done. <laughs> and if I have to stop and I don't have something to hold on to, I'm in big trouble. Well, I made it to this major intersection. We're talking like, you know, the four lanes, the median. I didn't tell my mom because she would not have been happy with this. And I got there, and luckily there was a stop sign that I was able to hold on to. And I waited for my moment to cross this busy intersection. And finally, the way was clear. And I pedaled, not realizing that the wheel had gotten stuck in a little divot there in the asphalt. Now, if you remember, I told you, if the wheel doesn't move, the part I'm sitting on does. And I was not expecting the part I was sitting on to move. And I came crashing down. I ended up with a broken hand. Right? Most people are like, yeah, it's an old football injury. I have to tell people, like, yes, it's from a unicycle accident. I had blood gushing down my legs, and then walking back home, pushing the unicycle on my little walk of shame. And a guy from his yard says, hey, you're, you're pretty good on that thing. And he wasn't being sarcastic. He had seen me earlier ride by. And at that moment, I kind of realized, you know what? I don't have to be the best. I just have to be memorable. And it's the same way with a lot of things that we do. All of you are good at what you do. There's a good chance you're not the best at it. A lot of times there's somebody better. There's somebody cheaper. There's, there's somebody that can maybe outdo you in a certain way. So 
Your job is to try to be as memorable and unforgettable as you can. And nothing makes you more memorable than when you can connect with somebody through a story. In fact, to me, the greatest influencer who ever lived, lived 2,000 years ago. And he was known for telling some pretty good stories. And so, I am going to work with you guys today and show you a few of the ways that I come up with stories. Because something I hear all the time from people, I don't have stories. My life sucks. I'm boring. And you only feel that way because the things that you experience every day, you just take them as life, not realizing that they're incredibly unique to you and that there's magic in them. So to help you discover this magic and realize there's stories everywhere, here's what you have to do. play God. <laughs> Little G. Okay? <laughs> We're not going to like get all blasphemous up here. That's not even part of the plan. But there's certain words that have been used to describe God. Words such as omnificent, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. We're going to go through a few of those. I'm going to show you kind of how you can take those in and help you discover stories and content and things you just had no idea you had. All right? Sound fun? Good, because it's all I've got. (laughs) Omnificent means unlimited creativity. And all you Google Analytics people are like, oh no, right? That's the wrong side of my brain. It's okay, I've got some stuff for you coming up. But let's roll with creativity. We're going to take omnificent, unlimited creativity, you got to be creative and omnipresent. Be everywhere. Be everywhere. Many of you may have noticed that I, I walk around with this, this little gizmo shooting video. And those who know me really well know that I do it all the time when I'm at a conference. No. Talking about the camera, not my wife. <laughs> Although she comes with me as well. Okay? Both give me lots of attention. This is what happens when you know too many people here. (laughs) But by being everywhere, what I mean is that you're always looking for stories because they're always happening. And when you start to recognize them and and realize that you see them, one of the things I always tell people is you got to get in the habit of writing them down, either at the end of the day or in the moment, depending on whether you can remember them at the end of the day or you're like me and, and Fanzo and deal with the ADHD. And if something walks in front of you, and then you go back to write down the story, you have no idea what just happened. But write them down, okay? But one of the fun things that happens when when I'm I'm always capturing video or capturing moments, I actually learned from my wife. One day, I noticed that she had taken little short clips of video and made these videos that kept repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating, and, and some people would call them GIFs, and some would call them GIFs, and I really don't care what you call them, okay? Because... I'm going to call them gifts, okay? And I've, over the years, been able to capture gifts of almost everybody who's speaking here this week. (laughs) And because of that, I've built relationships, friendships, had some court-ordered, like, cease and desist moments. But overall, we've grown closer. And all of these have a story. I remember the moments, what was going on. But at the same time, it also allows somebody else, if they use these, to decide what the story is themselves. And sometimes you got to take a little creativity and do that. We had one moment I was capturing some video at a conference, and a friend of mine, her name's Erin Sell, some of you know her. Um, I was just panning the crowd, capturing some B-roll for whatever epic thing I was going to put together. And I saw Erin dealing with this sandwich clamshell, trying to close it. And I didn't really even notice it until I was editing video later, and I was like, what was going on there? Now, you can't always take this kind of license, but mostly I just want to show you this because I just really like it. Um, I decided to come up with the story myself.
Oh, boy. By the way, Team Us, that's uh, my wife and I. Uh, we actually use the hashtag real Team Us because we just, we just love doing a life together and, and sharing moments like that. That was, that was a fun one. Now, there's other opportunities. You, you have family. And trust me, you want to have stories and capture some fun moments? Capture moments with your family. Here's one we were able to capture. We had our, our niece with us at a little uh, deal in uh, Houston. We were staying at a hotel. It was her first time doing that. She was incredibly little. And it was her first time to ever see a telephone with a receiver and a hand set. Trying to take a selfie with it. <laughs> Can you take a picture of Cha Cha? <laughs> I won't share the whole thing because of because of time. But Brian, you're welcome to use that because if you want to, you know, hey, don't get behind technology; it's always changing. You have the ability to do that. I'm, I'm just trying to show you that, that moments happen. They always happen. You just have to be paying attention and catch them. Omnipotent. All-powerful. Ha, 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 ha. Or ho, 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 ho. Thank you. He, 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 he. <laughs> Sometimes you have to take things into your own hands a little bit, I guess would be the right way to say it. And uh, I can never tell if I've hit this or not. Uh, use your power and create moments. There should be something behind this. I don't know why it's not showing. Um, use your own power to create moments or create stories uh, for other people. And what happens is you're... I let myself get thrown off by the daggum slide. Um, when you create moments, then you allow other people to engage with you. You're kind of bringing them into the story because you created the moment for the story to happen. An example of this is uh, we go to a conference in San Diego, and we had this tradition where we invite people, a few people, not a big group, small groups, better stories, more intimate, chance to make connections, build relationships. But we invite a small group, six to eight people, to eat lunch with us at a restaurant called Lucha Libre Tacos. And it's kind of like, if you've seen Nacho Libre, the movie, pretend they made a taco shop that was themed based on that whole wrestling style. And that's what it is. And we rent, or not rent, we reserve, the wrestling ring because you can eat in the wrestling ring. You can even grab the microphone, the let's get ready to rumble, and be like, we need refills. And so we invite a small group to come and do that. And that lunch is actually another reason along a journey that I'm here, because we invited Jessica to come be a part of that, and we're able to make the story their story. Um, we have a gif of Jessica. She's lifting weights at the uh, Lucha Libre taco shop. Um, another moment, I don't want to press the next button because I don't want this video to play yet. Um, my wife and I at a conference, we took a piece of cardboard and we put the YouTube logo on it and put, please help, need subscribers, and we just sat in the lobby and looked sad. Go? <laughs> oh? Okay. There she is. <laughs> People, because of this lunch, we've, we've created our own moments, our own stories together, and I've ended up doing business with some of them, right? Because that's the ultimate goal here, right? We want to be able to market, and that's, that's what these stories do. Same with this particular moment where we said, please help, we need subscribers. People came out to see what these crazy people were doing, and we had a moment with them. And it was the, the power of the smile. And then we had a story. We knew how we met them. Oh, we met you when this happened. And now we share a moment. And it's just a powerful connection. The other was mentioned by Damien. He said, I do these weird airport pickups. And this is the first one I ever did. It was for a guy named John Kapos. Uh, he's known as Chocolate Johnny. He has a chocolate shop in Australia. He makes the chocolate, sells the chocolate. And on his Snapchat stories, he would always use that little speed up voice, you know, that and pretend he was talking to his Oompa Loompas. And we were going to go pick him up for this conference in Denver. And I told my wife, what if we picked him up as an Oompa Loompa? And my wife, knowing me so well, went, sure. chocolate factory, and I heard he's coming to Denver, and this could be my big opportunity. It's Charlie's! It's Chocolate Yanny! Chocolate Yanny! I've been looking for you everywhere! <laughs> 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 
Okay, I have a little bit of a reputation, I guess. When people were like begging for clubhouse invites, it was so big, I, did, I didn't have to. One, I had an Android, and at that time I couldn't get on. But John actually reached out to me and said, I have a clubhouse invite. I want to give it to you. I want to make sure that you're there. And that's because we created a moment and we created a story together. That, honestly, every year I get emailed this because it shows up in like the top 20 airport pickups of all time on lists now. It's like, it's like I always wanted to leave a legacy. <laughs> the next one is omnibenevolent, all loving. This is when stories really start to get powerful and it's when you st stop caring so much about yourself and you start to care about others. Um, Mark Schaefer, who actually is, is here today, and that's super awesome. Um, in his books, it talks about the fact that we're in a day now where the, the customer is the marketer. And so if you can get the customer to market for you um, and take this, some of it off of you and let them be the center of the story, there's a chance to create some really memorable moments. We had one. My wife paints custom shoes. They're fabulous. And uh, one of our fellow marketing people ordered a pair, and we brought him to a conference, and we shot video of him opening them. And then we took that story, and then we also kind of personalized it around who he was and what he did for a living as a social media marketer, and we created like his own special moment in a video. And what that did, and it does every time, when you try to get somebody else's story, is it opens up a portal of belonging. I'm going to show you the video we created with him in a minute. It's fun. But I want to tell you a story I heard recently was uh, by a pastor. He said he was just finally coming to the United States, and he wanted to try Chick-fil-A. <laughs> that was like one on his bucket list. And so he had a taxi cab driver pick him up and take him there, and he felt like there was a moment where he just needed to ask this taxi cab driver his story. And uh, so he said, do you mind going through the drive-thru, get some chicken, I'll, I'll get you some chicken, but I'd like to hear your story. And the driver teared up, and he said, I've been in this country for years, and no one's ever asked me my story. Think about the connection those two have now. And the night my wife and I heard that, we went out to a restaurant that we go to all the time. Like, we know the owners. We're friends with them on Facebook. I have the same birthday as the owner. In fact, my wife brought a cake one time for my birthday to the restaurant before she knew it was also my birthday, and she almost ate it before they sang happy birthday to me. But we're that close. And I said, you know what? Let's ask them their story and invite them over. And so we did, and we said, hey, you guys are always cooking for everybody else. Can we invite you guys over one night to cook for you and hear your story? And we got the same exact answer. We've been here for years, and no one in the United States has ever asked us our story. There's power in asking other people their story. And that includes your customers. I'm going to show you a video right after this, this next one where we had the person with the shoes, where there was this group of doctors who did not want to be on camera. But their marketing person said, you have to be on camera. Chad's going to come put you on camera. And we want to hear about all the things you like to do in the community when you're not working. And then I got there and started talking to them and found out they don't do anything in the community when they're not working because they're just so tired from the hours that they put in. But I started asking them more questions and digging a little bit deeper into the why do they do what they do. And I'll show you their response right after this, this next one. This is the... Uh, the one with the, uh, the shoes. Blaney, you need to be in here. So you're gonna do a video of me that's gonna go on my story. So, ready? This is Laney. She paints shoes, so I ordered custom shoes from her. <laughs> okay, <just stop. laughs> 
okay, this is, a, this is a little bit of a long video, so I'm gonna show you the whole thing. So if you wanna see it, you'll have to kind of visit us online, but if you wanna see what those shoes look like, you can find my wife later and ask her. <laughs> see what I did there? <laughs> These doctors, I, I started talking to them, they, they have an emergency room where they're, they don't, they're not bombarded, they're kind of a private emergency room, and they're able to see patients and give them a little bit more time. And I asked them, after I kind of, I got them to forget about the camera and realize, let them realize I was just there for them. I just wanted to know about them. And they relaxed. And I asked every single one of them, who benefits more from this being able to spend more time with the patients than the patients or you guys as the doctor? And they all said almost the exact same thing. I, I think there's a, a genuine satisfaction when you actually take the time out to to talk to the patient, get to know the patients in greater detail. Uh, a lot of the things that you just sit around and say, you know, if we had our own emergency room, this is what we would do. What we envisioned when we were back in medical school. My favorite way to practice medicine is as if I were caring for one of my own, you know, my sister or one of her kids. And I know Elite Care allows me to practice that way. And this is the way I, I thought medicine should be practiced. All of them said the same thing. Being here lets me be the kind of doctor I went to medical school to be. And that's turned into a, a marketing campaign, and we've shared their stories. It's the most viewed videos they have on their channels. We turned them into six-second YouTube ads, trying to get people to click and watch more, and it's the most clicked uh, things we run on YouTube for them. And it's because people connected with seeing a doctor who said, I get to be the doctor I actually wanted to be when I, was, when I was a kid, when I went to school, I get to be that doctor. We never would have gotten that if we hadn't really genuinely shown concern for them and loved them enough to where they said, I'm gonna share a part of you, that, part of me that, that some of them didn't even think about or realize was there. So sometimes you have to pull the story out of them, but if you do it with love, people will open up when they know that you genuinely care about them. The last one is omniscient, all-knowing. All it's where I'm gonna give you a couple little things, a couple little tricks that I use to help me when I'm trying to remember stories because content isn't created, content happens. But it's hard to recall. When I sit down, I'm like, oh, okay, I want to do a story. I need, I got a, I've got a story. What's, what's something that's happened to me? And I can never remember them. I've learned a couple of exercises. This first one I learned from uh, an author of a book called Story Worthy. And I call it the memory jog. Here's how it works. You find a quiet place. You need a piece of paper and a pen. 10-minute timer. You choose a word, and you start writing. And you do not stop until the time is up. So if we had time right now, what I would do with you, and I'll actually do it at Table Talk tomorrow, is I would say, uh, okay, here's the word, it's bobblehead. And you'd write bobblehead, we'd start the timer, and you have to just write. And you just write, and you write. Whether, and if you don't have something to write, what I do is I'll start writing numbers. The whole word, O-N-E, T-W-O, or colors, purple, red, green, until something else pops in my head. And when I do that, suddenly magic happens. This is one, and it's gonna be really hard for you guys to see it, but that I did, use the word bourbon. I ate with bourbon, grandma, grandpa, piano, conic. Tosh got me into that during Music Man. Jill Hayes took a chance on me. Matt's my best friend for life. Just saw him in Dallas. He's still thin, what a punk. I haven't been that thin since I was 16. Started driving then, had to have my Eagle Scout first. I like Scouts, but it wasn't super cool after 16. Had some fun times, Philmont. And it took me down this, this path. And I started remembering all these stories. And one of them that I remembered was when I was 12 years old and I got to go to the camp for the first time and I was waiting at my house and the van pulled up and they were ready to pick me up and I got in the van and took off to scout camp. Super excited, not so much for the camp, but because when you're 12 and it was your first time at camp, you got to go snipe hunting. <laughs> and this was, this was my year. And I was gonna snipe hunt like nobody had ever sniped hunt in the history of snipe hunting. I was gonna show them how it's done. And the night came and they took me to the hunting ground. Happened to be an abandoned and a really old cemetery. And they said, Chad, here's a plastic bag, a flashlight, 
and a whistle. And we're going to go out into the woods and we're going to bang the trees because when we do that, the snipes fall from the trees because they can't fly. Not once did I ever think, how do they get up there in the first place? I just said, okay. And when they fall, you're going to blow your whistle and shine the light in this bag because snipes glow in the dark. That's cool. And the whistle sounds like their mom. So you're going to blow that whistle. After we knock them to the ground, they're going to think it's their mom calling and they're going to see the light because their mom also glows. And they're going to come running right into your bag. And then you close it up and we'll be good to go. I said, you can count on me. And they took off into the woods, started banging on trees. And I kept blowing my whistle and blowing my whistle. And they kept banging on the trees. Started to sound like the banging was getting a little further away, but they were still banging on them. And I kept blowing my whistle. And the banging got quieter and quieter. And I realized, they're just trying to go where the snipes are. I'm going to keep blowing my whistle. And I kept 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 blowing my whistle. Till finally, they realized I wasn't going to give up and had to come back and get me. (laughs) The goal was to scare me and make me take off running back to camp. But they learned instead that when Chad says he's going to do something... He's going to do it. And I tell my clients the same thing. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. It doesn't matter how dark and scary it might get, you can count on me. And I was able to find that story through this fun little exercise. And we'll play around with it at the table talk. But the other one... Dad juggled apples. How did I come up with that? I followed the map backwards. Mark Schaefer has a book, his newest book, Cumulative Advantage. He's here today. It is the only book I've ever gotten in the mail, opened, sat down, and did not get up until I finished it. Cover to cover. It was that good. And he has given me three signed copies that during the table talk tomorrow... I will give away to three people, but you need to come having written out and done the little writing exercise I just mentioned. But in his book, he talks about advantages that we have that that allow us to get to certain places. I'm not going to go into the details of the book, but a part of it that kind of spoke to me was, okay, what advantages have I had that have allowed me to get to where I've gotten? And so I did that with coming here. And this is super small. But what I found out and realized as I started following the map backwards was I shot video for Jessica at Social Media Marketing World 2020 party. I spoke at, spoke at Social Media Day Denver 2019, attended Social Media Week Lima 2019, and created gifts. Met Jessica after inviting her, lunch, her to lunch at Lucha Libre Tacos for lunch. Got the nerve to ask Jessica to, to lunch because of the interaction in groups together and people we knew in common thanks to Social Media Marketing World 2018. I got introduced to several inner circle folks at Social Media Marketing World thanks to shooting video with Owen Video. I got to do that because I was uh, owning my own agency for the first time. And blah, 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 blah. And it snowballed. And I kept working my way back and working my way back and working my way back until suddenly, suddenly, I remembered this ugly, ugly green shag carpet that was in my house in 1978. That's a year from long ago. And growing up there with a dad who was from a generation where dads were sometimes a little strict. In fact, I was a little scared sometimes. We had a kind of a rough relationship, my dad and I, back then. Dad would come home from work, sit in his chair, watch TV. Mom was doing, you know, woman stuff. It was that time. We only had three channels, no remote. If dad wanted the channel changed... He'd call my name, I'd come from the back of the house and come change the channel. It was like that. My dad kind of scared me. When I did something wrong, I'm not going to say he abused me, but he also didn't spare the rod, right? (laughs) And then one day we were in the dining room and he just randomly out of nowhere picked up apples and started juggling them. And I suddenly saw my dad differently for the first time. There was this, this fun 
creative, entertaining version of my father. And it wasn't until I did this little exercise, thanks to reading Mark's book, actually, and taking my little spin on it, that I realized that that was a moment that I started to see my dad differently. I'm not saying he changed overnight, but he and I have an incredible relationship now. He's an awesome grandfather. He's, he's, a, he's a great dad. But it, when he juggled apples, I also realized that if you are just a little different and do something outside of the norm, you can change the way people see you. I mentioned earlier that I rode unicycles, but I also juggled. When I was 12, I suddenly had a desire to start learning how to juggle, and my brother and I started team juggling and performing, and we met lots of people, and it created all these opportunities, and they're in this really small list that's hard to read, but I found that because I followed the map backwards. Why am I here? How did I get here? Oh, it's because of this, because of this, because of this. And every ending has a whole different path, and you will rediscover so many stories about yourself that help shape you into who you are and that are worth sharing. That's the last little bit of this, is you've got to share them, y'all. Your stories are your unique selling proposition. I don't care what anybody says. You can have this product or that product, but you, your stories are your unique selling proposition. And if you can have unconditional love and omnibenevolence and care about other people's stories, your customer stories are your ultimate selling proposition. You just have to find these stories. One last, one last story here and I'll, and I'll close up. Hopefully this made sense. And, and if it didn't, that's okay too. But when I was a, a kid, six years old, I had a best friend, and his name was David. And David and I were, we were inseparable. I mean inseparable. We did everything together when we could. We were Batman and Robin. That's who we were. And uh, in fact, we believed that we were Batman and Robin so much that our parents made us costumes. I was Robin, and I was okay with that. I don't have to be the main guy. But I was, I didn't pretend to be Robin. I was Robin. I was so sure I was Robin. I told my friends in preschool, no, I, I am Robin. And to prove it, one day I wore the costume to school. I'm glad this happened in preschool and not eighth grade. <laughs> but David and I were, were super close. And I'd go to his house and his family had this game that they liked to play. They called it Find the Penny. And so they had this penny and they would put some little sticky stuff on it so that you could put it wherever you wanted, stick it places and hide it. And then when you were done, it was everybody's job to go and find the penny. And I remember one day it was my turn and I put it on this fireplace behind this box. No one, ultimate hiding place. And I said, I'm ready. <laughs> Kid you not, they walked right to it. And they found the penny. You pull that down maybe a little. I don't know if that's possible, but um, I remember one, one morning, uh, it wasn't my weekend to go over and hang out with Daniel, um, but he, uh, or with David, sorry, Daniel's another friend of mine, um, with David, and uh, I'm at home I'm watching Saturday morning cartoons, and some of you guys are like, what Saturday morning cartoons? The Saturday morning cartoons, you had, we didn't get to DVR or record stuff. We, if you wanted to watch cartoons, you had to watch them when you watched them. And so I was up watching my Saturday morning cartoons, and wishing I could go play with David. And the phone rang, because back then you could hear the phone ring. And my mom picked it up, and I wasn't really paying attention. But uh, I, I knew she was done, because I heard her hang up, because that was something else we had to do back then. We had to hang the phone up, and you heard a click. And she came into the living room, and she said, Chad, that was, that was David's mom. I was like, oh, yeah. His other stuff canceled. We're going to hang out and play. And uh, she said, uh, Dave, David actually was going to go to his other friend's house today. I was like, oh, okay, well, I already, I already knew that. I already knew that. No big, no big deal. Um, and he said, my mom said, uh, when he went today, his parents for the first time decided to let his sister walk with him to go there. And uh, when they got to the the busier street. And it was his first time to cross it. His sister didn't see the, the truck that was coming. Chad, David, David died. 
I'm almost 48 years old now. But the power of that story is still there. The guy I played find the penny with. About a week later, his parents showed up at my parents' house. David grew up in a religious family, a faith-based family, and with the idea that one day when he was older, he was going to go do some mission work and, and serve. And uh, he saved up money so he could go and do that. He saved his pennies. <laughs> and they came to the house, and they said, hey, Chad, I know you, you also maybe one day want to do some mission work, and so we're going to give you his bank. It looked like a little dog. And it was filled with just pennies. And for me, every one of those pen pennies was a memory. It was a story. And all of you guys have those. They're not just pennies. They're not just worthless pennies. Their value is more than you could possibly imagine. You just got to share them. You got to share them. You got to tell them. You got to find them. And I promise you, when you do, you will... It'll just... We could change the world. We can change it with stories. Thanks. Thank you.